talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the things that surround what took place. And I was talking to my pastor this morning coming in that it's so familiar to me, and yet I pick up on new things as I, I share on it. But I never want it to get old. What he did for us is amazing. You know, uh, two weeks ago we started into the cross, and uh, last week we dealt with it is finished. Amen. How he finished the work of salvation. And today I want to talk to you about something that it, you may be familiar with these two names. C.S. Lewis, tremendous writer. Another one, Josh McDowell. And they use this term, and it really may not be a word, but it is a word. Let I me mean, you know what I'm talking about. And the word is trilemma. You know what dilemma is? Amen. When you're in a dilemma, uh, I, I can think of a few things I can say about dilemmas. But let's just stick with trilemma. In other words, three things that are uh, seemingly out of the norm. So here we have a man of 33 years of age who's been sentenced for death for a crime of love. When you think about it. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Uh, Christ, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. To understand his death is to understand his love. That he loved you. Amen. He loves, uh, he loves people. And because of that love, he died for that. And he said his father so loved the world that he came. And to shed his blood for us and for those that believe, it has the power to wash away their sins. But it doesn't stop there. You know, they beat him. They ripped open his body. We understand this thought today of DNA. And when you trace the DNA of Christ, you will see that his DNA was found in Herod's palace. It was found in a garden outside of Jerusalem, mixed with his sweat. All over the scourging post, his DNA was found. The wicked whips of destruction on the ends of them, there would be found DNA. The shoulder of a man named Simon of Cyrene, you would find his DNA. And all over the road to Golgotha, the largest concentration at the bottom of a cross at a place called the skull. The first trilemma, and this, these are two trilemmas I want to talk to you about. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. Everybody good with that? Okay, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. So just stay, stay put here with it. So the, the first trilemma was an empty tomb. You, you, when you put somebody in the, in the grave, they stayed in the grave. The second one was the empty grave clothes. Not only had Jesus disappeared, but he left his clothes, the grave clothes there. That means that somewhere between the tomb and hell and heaven, he got redressed. You ever think about that? I mean, he didn't bring a suitcase into the tomb with him. Amen. But he left the clothes he died that they wrapped him in in the tomb. And when we see him again, he's clothed again. Hmm. That's a trilemma. The third one was his uncanny appearances. He just showed up at places you didn't expect to see him. And then the second trilemma will be how do you look at Jesus? Because how you look at him in life will determine how you're going to spend eternity. Is he a liar? If he was, he was a very good liar. Is he a lunatic? You know, the problem with lunatics or crazy people is they don't know they're crazy. My pastor told me today, he said, he's struggling with a sense of smell. He can't smell. He said, now, I, I haven't tested positive for anything, but I've lost my sense of smell. He said, that bothers me because I like wearing cologne. How many know if you can't smell and you put on cologne, you put on too much? I work out at a little gym, and uh, there's a man in there. He, he has the uh, features of a, and I'll say it kindly for you uh, older folk, young folk don't know who Elmer Fudd is. But he has a little Elmer Fudd look to him, and he, he wears earphones, and uh, he gets excited. And he doesn't realize, and I think he was a, a drum guy. Yeah, whatever they, those guys are. He, he throws his hands up, while, and he's on the treadmill, and he's got his hands up, and, every, and he's watching his phone. And he'll go, hey, hey, hey. And he doesn't realize how loud he is. And I find it to be a delight. I mean, I'm loving this moment because this is good. Because when your ears, get, when you can't hear, you get too loud. You can't smell. You wear too much. If you're a lunatic, you're crazy. You don't know it. 
Don't look around. <laughs> so Jesus was either a liar or lunatic, crazy, or Lord. That's the other trilemma we're going to talk about today. Are you comfortable? I want to start with just a quick scripture out of John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. I mean, when you're afraid, the thing you need is peace. The thing you needed all last year was peace. So important. So when I look at this, they're afraid. They're in a room. They're locked. Jesus has died. Their hope is gone. And he shows up and he says, Peace be to you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. Amen. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I like the thought that in John chapter 20, verse 20, the word saw is there. 20, 20. Amen. They saw the Lord. Their eyes were open. Now, I believe the verses were man-made. They're not um, anointed, I would say that. But I find it interesting that 2020 of John, and it helps me remember. I remember verses that way. Exodus 13, 13 says, in order for a donkey to live, a lamb had to die. So when I think of 13, 13, I think of double trouble. You follow where I'm going? So I, I, that's how I remember scripture. I, I just find a way. Uh, your names. When I try to remember people's names, I try to relate it to something. I won't even tell you, son, what I relate your name to. Amen. But, but it helps me remember names as I do things. In the same way with scripture. Father, thank you for the word of God. I ask, Lord, for, there's a peace in this house today. The testimony of Pat's resurrection. God, what, what a great testimony, your faithfulness and mercy. God, I thank you, Lord, for the word of God. And, and at times we get caught in trilemmas. We, get, we don't understand everything that takes place around us. But, Lord, faith tells me I believe you over everything else. So I thank you for your word, God, and let it bring hope to our lives. In Jesus' name, everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Let's talk about the first uh, trilemmas and deal with the unoccupied tomb. Verse 1, John 20, says early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now we understand it's the third day in which Jesus had died. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. What book are we reading out of? John. Who loved Jesus? John. Amen. He mentions it over and over. I think sometimes you've got a little insecurity when you have to mention it that many times. Amen. But he throws it out there. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started running for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, who was that? John, outran Peter. Now, I'm telling you, there is a little insecurity in this guy. Amen. Ran, amen. And reached the tomb first. Now, when they got to the tomb, the tomb was empty. They ran. They wanted to see what was happening. They were skeptical. Uh, they were skeptic as disciples. Even though they'd been with him, they thought, uh, surely he hasn't resurrected. Surely he's out of there. There, there are theories about the, the uh, resurrection of Jesus. The first theory was the brave disciples stole his body. Let me preface that again. The brave disciples. Where are the disciples? They're locked in a room and they're afraid. They're chicken. They're scared. Amen. So they're locked in. So the first one said, you know what? They, they, they broke in and they stole the body away to prove his resurrection, that he actually resurrected. The issue with that was all the guards that were around the tomb and that the tomb, the stone had been rolled there by, I understand, about six soldiers and they sealed it, which means they put some type of ribbon or wax or something on there to seal the tomb. In other words, nobody could get inside that tomb except for the king's mandate or whoever gave it the go. So let's understand this. The disciples did not steal his body. Second, some believe that Jesus played possum. He swooned. Have you ever heard the phrase, saved by the bell? Saved by the bell comes from a phrase uh, in the 18th, uh, 15th to 18th century where if somebody died, they didn't know for sure if they were dead. And so they would put them into a coffin and tie a string around their finger, run it over a little, uh, a little eye knot, and put a bell on it. And if perhaps they wake up, Somewhere between the, uh, the service and the graveside, 
and they start shaking in there, you would hear the bell ringing. If you heard the bell ringing, that means they ain't dead. They, they swooned. Or they've, uh, the word we would use is play possum. Have you, and you, you're country folk. You don't know what possums do. My dog came in the house the other night with a possum. Now, I got a big dog. I ain't got one of these little cute toy things y'all, some of y'all got. Amen, little lap dog. My dog is big. Amen. And uh, he's a cane corso, and I opened up the door. I let him in at night so he can go to bed. I opened up the door, and he's got a possum in his mouth. Amen. Walks in the house. Cold, get out of here with that possum. Amen. And he thinks he's got a play toy or something. The thing about it, it wasn't dead. He just, and they so ugly. If God ever created an ugly creature, it was the possum. Amen. That is an ugly creature. Amen. And it kept sneaking over the fence and stealing my dog's dog food. So finally, me and Coda, we remedied that thing. I ain't going to go any further with that. I don't want to get in trouble with whoever you get in trouble with for taking out possums. But, man, when they play dead, they play dead. I mean, they, they'll just, they, you can poke them, punch them, shoot them. And some believe Jesus played possum, that he had swooned on the cross, revived in the coolness of the tomb, rolled back a stone that took six soldiers to roll in place and walked away and lived happily ever after. How many of that didn't happen? Amen. He's lost too much blood. He's lost his body fluid. He's dead on the cross. He said it's finished. He laid down his life. Luke said he laid. Tuesday, Wednesday night, I talked about the last saying. He laid down his life. He gave it up. And after he done that, it was over. He was dead. And the issue with this is a lot of other men and women had been raised from the dead. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. The widow of Cain's son was raised from, from the dead. We understand that, that as you walk, Lazarus was raised from the dead. But no man had ever raised himself from the dead. And this is what changed everything. That's why hell shuddered when Jesus said, I lay down my life and I pick it up again. Oh Amen. That's who I, So surely he didn't swoon. The biblical fact is he rose. Everybody say he rose. Yeah. Amen. He only borrowed the tomb. He didn't need it for, but for a few days. I mean, you know, if you don't need something but for a couple of days, don't buy it. I find out it's easier for me to rent a room than to buy something. It's easier for me to rent a car than to buy something if I only need it for a few days. Hallelujah. Well, I, I went to a few proms. You know, I wasn't as pretty as everybody else in, in high school, so I rented the tux because I only needed it for a few days. Amen. I knew later on in life, though, if I was going to, you know, I got born again somewhere in there, and I actually bought me a blue, pastel blue polyester 1979 suit and after I got saved man I wore that suit out thank God I didn't rent that one for that prom amen I had me a suit amen so the first thing that we see that is a trilemma is the fact that there's an unoccupied, unoccupied tomb now we get to the grave clothes amen in John chapter 20 verse 5 he, he bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there but did not go in that's talking about John then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived, and he went on in the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth, watch this, was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, uh, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, John, also went inside. He saw and believed. So he went, see, the lifeless body of Jesus, they believed he had around 100 pounds of spice, amen, uh, of ointments to keep him from smelling just like they would any other. 100 pounds, that's a lot of weight, man, of thick, fragrant slices. The cloth had been folded up by itself. You know, it's one thing that, no, 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 when, when you leave a place, uh, you know, sometimes I come in and I just sling a jacket. But, man, if I'm going to wear that thing again, I fold that jacket up and I lay it across something to keep the wrinkles from getting inside of it. It has been said uh, that oftentimes among the Jewish custom that if they ever had an opportunity to leave a meal and they walked away, they, they would make sure that they folded their, their napkin and said, and when they folded it and went away, it meant that they were coming back to finish their meal. That if they didn't really care, amen, they, they would just take that thing and, and just, just, just throw that napkin off to the side. It didn't matter then because it means I'm done with the meal. When Jesus left, he folded his napkin. 
What was he saying? I'm coming back. Amen. I'm not finished with what I, I got a few more things I want to deal with. I got to come back and get the folk with me. Can I get an amen? Amen. And then this uncanny appearance is John chapter 20 verse 10 says, When the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. Now, hold, hold on. Peter and John had already been in the tomb. Who was not in the tomb? The angels. Now, they done gone back home, and while they gone home, them angels slipped back in. Now, I don't know if they're hiding off in a corner or what they were doing, but the Scripture says there were two angels in white, that's why I always tell you, wear black here on earth. Wear black now. Because when you get to heaven, you don't get to wear black. You've got to wear white when you get there. So wear your black now. Okay. Just, just a little sidebar. I saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? She said, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they put him. That just fascinates me. You're going to walk into a tomb. And you know Peter and John was just in there, and they didn't mention angels. And then you walk in there, and there's two angels there, and you carry on a conversation with them. You're not even scared. So she said, but I, they had, my Lord was here. They took him away. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't recognize that it was Jesus. Verse 15. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I'll get him. Then Jesus said to her, I'm getting Holy Ghost book. Mary, when he calls your name, when he knows your name, it changes everything. That's why names are so important. Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. I know who you are. I know. I, I, she saw him, didn't recognize him, thought he was the gardener, and then he calls her by name. And when he, she said, she's reaching to grab, she's going to hold him. He said, whoa, woman, back off. I've not yet returned to the Father. Go ahead to my brothers. Amen. Tell them I'm returning to my Father and your Father. And your Father. Come on. I'm going to my God and your God. See, you don't realize this cross thing finished everything. Amen. It set us up for glory. Hallelujah. To Mary, I'm going to go to my father, your father. Amen. Seeing is healing. There's something about when you get to see. That's why I really believe that uh, a lot of this pandemic thing that's going on has hurt so many people because we didn't get to get in to see them. They didn't get to see us. Amen. There's something about seeing. Seeing is believing when I can connect, when I can hear your name, when you can say my name. There's something important about that. Psalm 147, 3. He says he heals the broken heart and he binds up their wounds. Amen. That's what he did for Mary. Her heart was shattered. And the disciples loved it, but there was something special about Mary. She loved Jesus. Amen. And to see that he's not in the tomb now, it affected her. And when he calls her name, Mary, amen, it did something to her. There's an excitement that's built inside of her. And then Jesus showed up and appeared to the disciples. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Do you know who killed Jesus? Well, let's say this. Jesus, nobody killed him. He laid down his life. But those who beat him, those who crucified him, those were Romans. But the scripture says they were locked in the room for fear of the Jews, not Romans. Sometimes you're more afraid of your accusers than your executioners. Sometimes executioners just carry out the plot or the plan. But it's the accusers that hurt you the most. It's the one who accused you of wrong. It's the ones who accused you of blasphemy. It's the one. They accused Jesus of all kinds of stuff. So they said, yeah, they were afraid of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands, his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Amen. With something about knowing him and having that joy of understanding when they saw, when they saw this, it's like their eyes were open. The trilemma. Empty tomb. Empty grave, clothes, and uncanny appearances. Now it brings you to this point, amen, 
the second trilemma, who Jesus claimed to be. John chapter 8, verse 48, the Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? The Jews said, you, you want to talk about racial issues? There were more racial issues 2,000 years ago than they are today. Amen. This issue between Samaritan and Jew, or Jew and anything else. Amen. So they called Jesus a Samaritan and demon-possessed. I like how Jesus answered this. He never said, I'm not a Samaritan. He, ne he didn't bring that up. He didn't say it. He just said, I'm, uh, listen, guys, I'm not possessed by a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there's one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this, the Jews explained, now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? And Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, this is that moment I wish Jesus had a big S on his shirt and ripped it open like that. Amen. It showed he was the super savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Who do you think you are? They said. And Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him. You claim, but you don't know him. Hmm. I know him. And if I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. Listen, it's so hard to separate politics, life, culture. The scripture's full of all of that. And so he's dealing with these Jews right now, and he just lays it out. He says, uh, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. Abraham saw it and was glad. Well, hold on. Abraham is in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis. Amen. And Jesus said, Abraham, Abraham rejoiced at seeing my day. See, what you may have forgotten and what they forgot is John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word is God. Nothing was created outside the Word. So what he's saying here is, hey, guys, before Abraham was born, I was here. And Abraham rejoicing about the day I showed up here. Amen. Because what I did here, or what I'm going to do here, is going to wash his sins away too. You, know, you want to study a guy that had a really rough life? Look at Abraham's life. Amen. He, he's going to get up with Sarah. Going to have a baby. Didn't happen. Got up with another woman, Hagar. She has a baby named Ishmael. Then Sarah gets mad because she said, well, it was Sarah's idea to start with. Sarah said, go ahead and go on in to, to, to uh, Hagar and, and everything be fine. And the baby shows up and Sarah gets mad. That Mormon theology can get you in trouble. And two wives. So he, he had to kick Hagar out and Ishmael out into the desert. Well, there went the Muslims. And he got home and then Sarah has Isaac. And there's the Jews. You wonder how all this started? You know, Jesus said, Abraham was glad to see when I showed up. It washed away his sins too. Come on, Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm preaching a lot better than y'all yelling. <laughs> I mean, you ain't going to get this in most other churches. I'm just going to promise you that today. They're afraid to tread where I'm talking. Jesus came to show us the Father. That's what he said. I came to show you, Daddy. He asked us to believe in him. Believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house in many rooms, John 14. He asked for us to accept and, and to accept worship of him. Amen. It was okay to worship him because he was God. Who do you say that I am? There are three choices. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that? Hey, Peter. He told Peter that. He said, Peter, who do you say that I am? You know what Peter said? He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I understand who you are. You're Lord. But here's the, here's the things you've got to deal with. First, you've got to decide, was Jesus a liar? Was he a liar? You know, when you're talking with people, I believe you guys understand Jesus. I believe you understand the gospel. But when you talk with people that don't understand the gospel, will you use this message on them today? Will you help them understand, not to be belittling or to put them down, but help them and ask them the question, can you explain 
an a empty tomb. No other God has an empty tomb. Can you explain the grave clothes that were folded and the angels that were there? Can you explain to me that Jesus showed up in the garden? That Jesus showed up back at the tomb on the outside. And that Jesus showed up in a room with the disciples. Can you explain to me, do you think Jesus was a liar? It's a good question. Because here's the thing. A lot of times we ask, well, do you believe in God? Do you know almost down the line they're going to say yes? The issue is that Jesus was confrontational. Amen. Jesus laid it out, said, if, look, there's nobody going to get to the Father except through me. You can't use this. Buddha or, 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 or anything else, hey, any, any crazy th thought of anybody else getting to heaven except through me. Amen. He was confrontational that way. Uh, he wasn't exactly inclusive. Hmm. When he was, then if he's a liar, he knew his claims were false. So he deliberately misrepresented himself. He said he was from God, lied, was God, lied. Then he must have been a hypocrite because he told others to be honest, but himself was teaching a living, a colossal lie. Then he was a demon, told others to trust him, amen, for their eternal destiny. If he couldn't back up his claim and knew it, then he was unspeakable evil. One of the things that I struggle with as your pastor is that I know I'm responsible for people. And I, I get word from people 25, 30, 40 years ago, still serving God because of a connection that me and them made. Some have actually started coming uh, back, found our church, and found me, and it's been an amazing thing. But I'm responsible to share truth with you. And what's, what's important is to understand that if Jesus, Jesus would have been a demon if he said, you've got to trust in me, in my father's house. He told me there's a house in heaven, H. He told me there's a kingdom in heaven. He told me that if I trust in him and believe in him, amen, I would not die. This earth suit would go back to the earth, but my spirit would be forever with him. He so, was so good at it, he convinced a guy named Paul who could quote the first five books of the Bible, knew the middle word of the first five books of the Pentateuch, amen, was a Benjamite, was a, a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He convinced him on, on, on the road, amen, to where, I forgot where he was on his road to, but he got it knocked down, he got blinded, he ended up at a uh, a prophet's house, his eyes got open, and it was Paul that later began to tell us over and over again that, that Christ loved us. He was convincing people, and to convince people of something that's going to spend your eternity, even your whole eternity with. If he's a liar, then he's demon possessed. So you got to get people to understand. You think he lied? How about, is he just a fool? For it was his claim of being God that led to his crucifixion. If he just kept his mouth shut, he'd have never been crucified. If you lied about who you really are, you got yourself crucified. Barabbas should have never went uh, free. He should have died on the cross, Jesus. But instead, you sat there with your mouth closed. You even asked Pilate, who do you say that I am? What do you guys think about me? Well, if he wasn't a liar, then he had to have been a lunatic. He had to have been crazy. He did not know his claims were false. I've met some lunatics in my life. You know, Jesus was saying he was the son of God. I've met some Jesuses. <laughs> I've met some Jesuses out there. And, and the thing is, I don't even try to convince them they're not. Because they're crazy. What I tell you about crazy people? They don't know. They're crazy. Amen. It'd take a miracle of God to shake them back into normalcy again. It is possible to be sincere and to be sincerely wrong. There's some things he claimed if he was crazy. These are what he claimed. He claimed that he was creator, savior, that he could raise the dead, that he was judge, light, shepherd, the glory of God, the first and the last, the redeemer, the bridegroom, the rock, the forgiver of sins, worshiped by angels, creator of angels, confessed as Lord. He said, hey, I'm all of this. So if he's a liar, he was a really good liar. Last point, Lord. You can't put him on the shelf as a good moral teacher. You got to make a choice. When he asked Peter, whom do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ. I think it's John 10, 10. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's it. Ten tons of truth. Thou art the Christ, the 
son of the living God. That's not John 10, 10. That's abundant life. A brain scramble. Thou art the Christ. That's who you are. You have to make a choice. You know, God doesn't say, you know, wander through this life and pick out one. Now, when you make him Lord, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. John 20, verse 29, amen, says, when Jesus told him, because you've seen me, there's that seeing again. Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen. That's me and you. And yet, believe. Jesus did, check this out. Jesus did many other miracles, miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Hallelujah. I close with that. Everything he did. So, and, and then it says he did other miracles that we don't know about. I mean, in those three years, he was a walking miracle. Everything that he did, heads bowed, eyes closed. It's a trilemma. The empty tomb, grave clothes folded, uncanny appearances. The first one, the second trilemma. He's either a liar or either he's a lunatic or he's Lord. You have to decide. And you may not decide that today, but you need to decide. Pastor, I need to make that decision. I don't know everybody in this house. I don't know you walk with God. I don't know those that are watching online right now. So I'm just going to say it to you. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, just throw your hand up right now, all over the building. Amen. You believe Jesus is Lord. There you go. See, I, this is the right kind of, right kind of all, uh, altar call. Seeing everybody's hands lifted toward heaven. I believe he's Lord. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus. Use me as a witness. Let me be a testimony. Let me get a message out to a world that is dying and going to hell. Help me help them understand you are not a lunatic. You are not a liar. But you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In Jesus' name, amen. What I just did is I commissioned this whole church to go be a missionary and to share this gospel with other people. Amen. You, you got the ammunition now. Amen. You got the word. Hallelujah. And you can take this and use it. Uh, you know, back when I was young, as, I just tell folks, well, you just got to believe. Then I realized later it was pretty easy for me because I felt like I was a miracle child. I was a misfit that God put in the kingdom. But then there's others that are intellectual. I meet these intellectuals today. I think they spent so much time on YouTube or something or sitting sta in front of the tube that, that they have no relationship with Christ, just they believe God. But man, when you fall in love with him, it affects your life, changes you. Amen? Amen. In front of you is your offering envelopes. Amen. I want you to reach right now. Even if you don't get one, I want to see you reach. It just makes me feel better to see you bend forward. Amen. Hallelujah. Get you an offering envelope. If you're making out an offering, amen, your tithe offering, just make it out to TLCC. Also, uh, I normally don't wear T-shirts to church. Katie, if you, if I, look, come here, Jamie. Come here, coach. Amen. Look at this. These, these, uh, you call these church merch. Church merch. Merch stands for merchandise. This is one of the sayings that I've been saying for years. Saved by the blood plus nothing. Amen. Amen. It's a, don't mind me. I'm just living holy wild at the little country church. Of course, this is misfit, and this is where misfits fit. Amen. At the little country church. Now, the neat thing about this stuff here is we have an online store that Katie's going to tell you a little bit about here in just a minute. And we don't have to buy these in bulk. Coach, and as a matter of fact, I could buy this in all different colors. I can custom design my own shirt, sort of. <laughs> Amen. So each month, we're going to be releasing two or three new shirts. And uh, then you buy, and Amazon brought these to me. Amen. Brought all three. Just dropped them off there at the church. They're already done. Already made up. And then we don't have to have anything by bulk. We don't have to store anything. This is an online store. You can get caps. 
You can get mugs. You can get all kinds of stuff. The neat thing about this is it, it forces people to look at you and think. And when they see me wearing a shirt that said misfit, they, they got to ask themselves, what, what do you mean by misfit? The kingdom of God is full of misfits. Amen. It's full of misfits. Jesus reached to everyone. Hallelujah. White collar, blue collar, red collar, no collar. Amen. He went after all of them. So, Katie, if you want to tell us a little bit more about this. Hey, guys. Um, you actually did a really great job explaining that. I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> so he's absolutely right. We're going to have all kinds of different merchandise available. Right now we're starting with these three T-shirts. And soon we'll have more shirt designs. We'll have hats, mugs, all of those things available on our website, holywild.net slash shop. However, it's not quite live yet. So if you go there right this second, you won't say anything. Um, but it will be live very, very soon, one week, maybe two. We're getting some of the last details kind of figured out as far as logistics to make it all ready to go. And essentially, everything will be delivered to your home uh, straight to you. It's within about a week or two. So um, just give it a little bit of shipping time. And there are there is going to be an opportunity to be able to buy um, from your phone, from your tablet, from inter internet, wherever. You can also visit any of, either of our bookstores at either location to be able to buy in, from a tablet um, in the bookstore. So if you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself, we can have someone kind of walk you through how to purchase a shirt online. And I think that's about it. Thank you to our wonderful models. That's looking so nice. What's your new merch? What's your new church merch? <laughs> All right, so April 16th through the 17th, we are going to have a Cubs Kids Arc Fund. 